What's up, y'all? It's Jordan from Mibble, <laughs> and we're back. You know, A's one ten percent athlete, where we break your slump. I'm here with the great, the one and only, Dr. Jess. Thanks, Jordan. I appreciate being here. Um, I'm Dr. Jess. I am a sports psych. He's been working with professional athletes, special forces, military intelligence for the last 12 plus years, and um, have a background in performance psychology, a PhD in that, a master's in mental health counseling, and another master's in sport and exercise psychology. And <laughs> here recently in the last year, I also did a TED talk about emotional contagion and how that affects athletes on the field. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm a junior at uh, Concordia. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I play baseball. Um, Get out, get out. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, following she, your lead. Right? She's great. No, she's great. Um, you know, we're going to jump right into it. You know, a lot of athletes have been sending me questions, and I've been I'm telling them, like, yeah, I'm, we're going to get to it. Don't worry. We're getting to it right now. <laughs> and um, first question is, how should athletes handle performance anger? Ooh, this is a good one. So in my background working with the military, I also got to work with a lot of interrogations. Mm -hmm. And in some of those, we would talk about some of the athletes that I've worked with are either getting recruited from college to pros or high school to college. And so I'll come in and work with an athlete and give them questions and like, how do you appear in front of the GM or your recruits, especially when they have high tempers? Mm -hmm. And most athletes, as they're getting drafted, will say, um, yeah, no, I don't have any problem, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And then I'm looking at them, I'm watching their body language. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, that one's a, that one's yeah, quick tempered right there. Right. And so I'll talk to the athlete and I'll say, hey, as you're getting drafted, um, some of those questions, we're looking at temperament, motivation, all the things. Are you a good team player? And in those moments, I'll say, when I feel high passion, mm -hmm. it often comes out as anger and I'm doing X, Y, Z to control it. What most people don't realize is that anger is a second emotion. And so... Mm. The people that often experience it are having something that's happening right beforehand, but don't know how to process that emotion. So it comes out in anger. Oh. So it could be doubt. It could be embarrassment. It could be fear. Whatever it is, it's a quick little response. And it's like, oh, no, I can't let anybody else see that. Mm -hmm. So then like, they just get mad. We won. What are yeah. you talking about? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> like, get out of my face. Okay. That yeah. makes so much sense. Right? <laughs> yeah. No but, wonder, no wonder and nobody tells that. you that. Right. You just think that like this person is just an angry person. It's mm -hmm. like, no, right behind that is I'm, I don't feel enough. And so I'm going to just come off rough. Right. But then what athletes don't realize is that type of mentality, unless they understand it and process it, will plateau across their career. Really? Because you're utilizing a force that's resistance. Mm -hmm. Like you're trying to get ahead of it, but then you're shortcutting yourself every single time because you can't get past the anger. It's baffling. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I did I never do that. No? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't get angry anyway. I just be like, oh, fuck it. Oh, I was <laughs> I was an angry athlete. Oh. <laughs> I hated to lose. I hated to not do things that were perfect and right. Like, mm -hmm. as a gymnast and a soccer player, I played in college as well for soccer, and I was a gymnast my whole entire life. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't do something right, I would stay after. If, some, if I had a, another competitor that beat me, it, but I knew that I was better than them, Ooh, it oh, was it was salty for yeah. a while. I, I remember when I was a little kid, I struck out one time and I was mad and I threw my bat. Yeah. And my mom came up and said, don't you ever do that again. So I, I never got mad. But it wasn't until like in college that uh, learning, you know, the theories and techniques that I even knew to even how to process the anger myself. And mm -hmm. so not only was it just translation into soccer, but it was happening in my own personal life as well because it's never been dealt with right. or understood. And so that fear, worry, embarrassment Yes, you experience it as an athlete, but we don't realize that we're multidimensional individuals, that we experience different things similarly in other fashions of our world. They're just packaged differently. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I like that. I like that. That's really good. I mean, and for our next question, I, I think anger ties into it because mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes when we're angry, we don't know why we're mad. Yeah. So it ties into it. And I know for me, whenever I tore my ACL... Ooh injuries yeah as an athlete I, hey all my athletes know you get injured oh yeah you're pissed for like weeks well that so. and it gets to a slippery slope so i also tore my acl mm -hmm. which one my left get, get out of here i tore my did left. you yeah oh, yes uh. i was in a soccer game i was in a co-ed game and this big burly dude comes out and just lays me out uh. and i after college too oh. i was just like really yeah so like it's never been the same yeah but um what we don't realize is because you're so active all the time in working out like religiously mm -hmm. that the moment that that becomes sedentary and stopping the psychological aspects of injury is like 
people don't realize how much it really affects that individual. Mm -hmm. Not only just anger, like it's really a griefing stage. And so like you have the stages of grief where you're angry, depressed, sad, and then accepting like the situation and then now being able to take action and overcome it. Right. Or it's this constant fear of what ifs, what if this happens again, then I'm done. Mm -hmm. What if I get hit the wrong way, I can't walk again. What ifs causes athletes to live in that fear based Mm -hmm. reality. And so a lot of our work is having them overcome just belief systems about what they're capable of. Like the, the technology and the conditioning programs with PT Mm -hmm. has significantly changed from the years when I first tore my ACL Mm -hmm. to the rehabilitation um, process that athletes get nowadays, like way quicker, more efficient. And I think it's more solidified in getting them back to the field faster. But in those PT sessions, not everybody's being dealt with on the mind and the mind's the one that's telling the body to move. Right. So I think that's still an area that a lot of athletes don't get access to. Mm -hmm. So during these even episodes and, you know, us talking Mm -hmm. back and forth, allowing athletes to have those resources, understanding like they're not alone Mm -hmm. and then what to do. Like, how do you, how do you overcome that psychological aspect of that injury? Yeah. I think that's a big thing too. Like any athletes watching this, I really want y'all to get on the app. And just tell your stories and yeah. like describe because I know for me when I tore my ACL, I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm yeah. like, I'm just there. And my best friend, um, shout out Devin, <laughs> she tore her ACL, PCL, oh, like, yeah. MC, like she tore, but she tore like multiple times. Mm. And she she like I was on the phone and I was like, Yeah, I don't know what to do. And she looked at me and she was like, I'm gonna be honest, it's hard. It's like so hard. it is so hard. Mm-hmm. But after you get surgery, you're gonna get through it and you just have to do it. You just have to trust yourself. Yeah. And then I went to my trainer, shout out my trainer, Lindsay <laughs> and um, Elizabeth. But yeah, I when I went to PT, yeah. Um, the first thing they told me was like, you gotta do it. Yeah. And once you start doing it, then it's like, okay, now I can get back into it. Mm-hmm. But then it's like it's such a different world than okay, you're in the facility, now you're making cuts. Now right. you're on the field, now you're like, Oh shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, please don't touch me. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's so crazy. And I think I think the biggest thing, if you're athletes, you're watching this, just trust yourself. Just do it. And if it don't work out, just try it another way. You just got to do it. Yeah, I would add yeah. to that is not just trusting yourself, but the team that you have. Because mm-hmm. really in that in that aspect of injury, you become so self, like you just become alone. You feel like you're alone. Mm-hmm. And so building with a community within your sport realm, there are so many athletes that have gone through similar situations right. and that have overcome and still excelled at a very high elite level, professional level, Olympic level. Right that are still able to compete. Now yeah. everybody's body is different and their belief systems about their recovery is mm-hmm. different, but they're definitely not alone. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that leads into like the next question is just like, how do athletes uh, maintain that like sport, that sport, that balance between sport and yeah. then like their life? Because I know mm-hmm. when you get injured now, that balance is messed up because you can't, you can't do the things that you normally do. And now it's like yeah. you get closed off into a bubble. So like, how can athletes um, balance that? So one of the things is, well, you're talking about balance, and I'm going to add prior to that, imagery is a really big piece to sports mm-hmm. psychology. So even though I'm not physically able to do the movements, mm-hmm. our brains have a hard time telling the difference between a reality and a dreamlike state. Mm-hmm. Have you ever woken up from a dream and you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. You're like sweating, sweating and, and like yeah. heart's racing. Your brain can't process the difference between like dream or real. Mm-hmm. And so when we ca- when we tell athletes about even going into surgery, prior to surgery, and post recovery, imagining like the body healing itself in that area, mm-hmm. the body's miraculous. It can do wonders. And there's tons of studies out there that will even show you that if I just did physical practice alone, mm-hmm. I would clearly get better, right? right? If I did just imagery alone, and then there was another group that just did like no practice whatsoever, no imagery either, the group that did imagery also improved, not as much as the physical, mm-hmm. because physical always trumps the mental part of like actually implementing it. But those that imagined like this was through like free throw shots Mm -hmm. still increased their percentage of free throws throughout the season than those that did nothing completely. And so we send these, you know, responses down to our body that in the smallest frequency is still training Mm -hmm. movements in our body. So to balance that, to help with it, imagery is a really big piece to it. This is kind of another fun fact with the injury piece yeah, and balance. Um, there was a study done where they inflicted a pencil sized wound on someone's arm, okay? Mm-hmm. And prior to, so the two groups were, one person had a caretaker 
and the other one didn't. Um, meaning like if I was an uh, older person and you're the person that I took care of, mm -hmm. there's more high stress in that scenario. Right. The other person just got to the, be like the normal age that the caretakers were. They yeah. didn't have other stresses. I'm sure there was stress, but not as much stress as taking care of somebody else. Mm -hmm. So what they found was that this small pencil sized wound ended up healing seven days faster, just a little one. Mm -hmm. The scar was smoother. There was less visual representation of that scar on those that were as not as stressed mm -hmm. as those that were. So if you think about like a pencil sized wound mm -hmm. and regulating like how you're thinking, how you're feeling towards the injury yeah. or stress alone. So the stress goes into balance, right. how I'm balancing my life we're healing our bodies quicker, faster, mm -hmm. and we're not having as like the rough edges mm -hmm. that end up healing in those scars, right. which is fascinating to me. Yeah. Now you take a bigger it's injury big. yeah, and the stress, trying to minimize it, plus the imagery on top of it, we can heal the body okay. so much faster on top of like your PT regimen right. than yeah. not having any of those level of balances. So yeah. I think, I think that's, I think that's like really true Yeah, because I'm, I'm more of like an easygoing person. I mean, I used to be like really hard on myself, like mm -hmm. really stressed out. And um, once I tore my ACL, I was like, you know what? Let's just kind of just yeah. post. Like, let's just like take it day by day. It is what it is. Like, I had so much fun just trying to lift my leg. It was crazy. Right. And then I came back. Like, I, I was running in four months. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's and, fantastic. And then I was pretty much 100% in six. That's great. Yeah. So it's like, I think y'all should, don't be stressed. It's, it's okay. It'll be all right. <laughs> I tell athletes to focus more on their mental game at that point mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter who you are. You can be the most elite athlete in the world and still have to train your brain to sustain that high level of competition. Mm -hmm. Or we're working on different aspects of your game. So like vision training, I'm not, I'm not running. I'm just working on my oc oculatives, you know, like right. I'm. I'm being able to expand my peripheral vision, my reaction training, just based off of like what I'm seeing. Right. So there's other ways that we can still train high intensity, mm -hmm. but not having to physically do it. Right. Um, in in the off seasons or in injury related aspects, the mental game is the most crucial part to be training so that we can solidify it. So that when they are ready, it's straight into it and not mm -hmm. the what ifs yeah. are non-existent. Yeah. So like speaking about the mental game, mm -hmm. um, like what are like some tips for like for them to increase that mental game because i know i know it's hard when it's like you don't have any proper training yeah. or like proper or a person to teach you like okay this is what you should do yeah and like for me i'll be like oh just go meditate and people be like bro i'm not meditating <laughs> okay, so thanks. right so yeah so how, how do you go about uh that? the biggest one is providing a directive to somebody mm -hmm. so our brains like to go down several different rabbit holes some faster quicker longer than others mm -hmm. and some can rebound quicker than other people's so what I attend to is what I usually will react to or engage in. And the biggest principle, or the quickest one I should say, is uh, the win principle. Mm -hmm. We use this a lot in our field, and it's called what's important now. So W-I-N, win, but I'm identifying what's important right now in this moment that I need to attend to. Right. Is it the time on the clock? Is it the crowd? Is it my coach? Is it my teammate? Is it the ruminating thoughts in my head? Or is it taking a deep breath and getting in position. And then when I'm in position, it's taking off and running a route mm -hmm. and then catching the ball and then whatever the case may be. Right. So small little increments of what's important right now because everything else is irrelevant right. to the task at hand. And so what's the task? How do I complete it? We use the win method. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, it really, like, it really, like, puts in perspective that like, everything in the past doesn't matter. Everything that's in the future don't matter because it's all about whatever yeah. you're doing right then and there. Yeah. And is I think I think that method alone breaks it down so much to where you can calm down and just focus on one thing at a time. Right. And what people get caught up in. So I'm gonna can I pick out your words for a second? Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> okay. So you said to what doesn't matter? Yeah. You said doesn't, right? Right. So oftentimes our brain can't process don'ts, shouldn'ts, couldn'ts, wouldn'ts. It hears everything after it. Mm -hmm. So if I say, Jordan, don't look behind you, there's this like tree. Oh, I almost like, looked behind me. I know, right? It's so hard. <laughs> but if I say, Jordan, keep your eyes on me, I just told your brain what I want it to do versus what I don't want it to do. And okay. so that holds strong. It solidifies those thoughts in our heads of like, what do I need to attend to now? Okay. And so giving your brain a directive to attend to is what's key for attention and mental game perspective. That's that's actually pretty crazy. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've been we've been touching at a lot of like things for like current athletes. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to touch on like something for former athletes. Mm -hmm. um, 
as a former athlete yourself and like leaving the game, um, how do you handle like leaving the sport that you love? Um, I don't know if it ever leaves you. Mm. I think that when I started gymnastics at two, three years old mm -hmm. and I still walk into a gym and I'm like, this is home. This is, I mean, this body may not look like a gymnast anymore, but mm. I definitely still feel like it. And it wasn't until I was probably like 26 ish. I stand up on a bar and I'm like, oh, I can still do a double back off of this. Uh, my mind sure thought I could, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I did a uh, double back and actually it was like a back and a half with my feet in the air <laughs> in the pit. So I was like, oh, okay. Now, now I don't think I am at that level where I can still do what I thought I could do. Um, so it almost goes back to giving back to the sport. I think mm -hmm. I see a lot of athletes who you don't ever leave it. You find ways to still be integrated with it and to still have impact within the community, mm -hmm. whoever it is that you're involved with in sport wise, right. which is why I ended up choosing sports psych myself. I was a head case as a gymnast. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm getting on the bar. Please, please get me through this bar routine. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happens, happens. But I didn't have access to any of these resources mm -hmm. as a kid. There was a, a, there was a small paragraph in my high school it was like my sophomore class, psychology class. And it said sports psychology and gave a blurb of what it was. And I'm like, right. that's what I'm doing. So since my sophomore year in high school, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. That's what's up. Yeah. It's almost, that, that's like some something like, like really divine. Right? Like perfect time. It is. That's how I felt the same way. But to answer your question, I don't know if it ever leaves you. Okay. And so it's finding ways to still be a part of the community mm -hmm. because you grow up with people that are become like your lifelong friends. Right. And then finding ways to, to still have those impacts, I think is probably the biggest key. Yeah. Or transitioning to fill, have meaning and purpose to have high intensity of like competition. I think that's where I found myself getting into environments with high stakes, like working with the military. It's a lot different than just a win and a loss. Like right. it's life or death. Right. And so these are high stakes where I can give back the tools and knowledge that I have to these people that are servicing our country and giving us so much more back. Um, so finding the impact, I think, is pretty crucial to a lot of those yeah. players that are stopping the game. Yeah. I like that. That's, that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then touching on, like, giving back. Um, you know, we're going to have, a, like, a lot of athletes watching this. Yeah. For, so, like, how can they basically relay what we're telling them, the message that we're giving them, and relay that back to their teammates? Um, I, know, I know a lot of times, you know, coaches say, oh, be a leader, yeah. don't be a follower. But, like, it's – you know, leader per se is really iffy at times. So, like, how can they just be a really good teammate and just be someone that their teammates can rally around? So, one of on the TED Talk that I talk about, um, emotional contagion is that key thing that you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. So, how I feel, how my energy is, we're energetic beings. Right. If I would have come in here and I sat in here and I'm like, hi, Jordan. Yeah, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, you got to go. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I like sports. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Look at how uncomfortable you're getting. Right? So I'm, cha I'm changing the tone in the room. Oh, my gosh, guys. Jordan does not like uncomfortability. Um, but no, I, 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 I do. Can, but, like, why? Like, you don't, there's no need for that. <laughs> I can change the energetic level just even with, like, the next person that I'm sitting with. Right. And science says that we can read it up to three feet, which is crazy. So mm -hmm. I start to increase my heart rate. Right. So I can see your legs moving all over the place. And all of a sudden that might radiate to me. And all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, oh, no, like, and I'm oh. getting nervous. Why is he moving? I don't know. Yeah. Um, or I can start to slow my heart rate down, my tone down. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden your body starts to relax. Right. So when we talk about like the impact of others as a leader, what you're doing, what you're saying and the energy that you're bringing, because we're so involved as like individuals that we have home life, school life, friends life, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. Mm -hmm team life that we're picking up all these energies throughout the day and we're holding on to them and we don't even know if they're ours Ooh. right so yeah. i'm walking in and i'm like i don't know what happened jordan today but like is it me kind of, like all right? of a sudden like he saw me and it just got like hmm. Mm. but it may not be it could have been like you had a just bad phone call right before i came in the door mm -hmm. but i'm taking it on as my own right and so we do that and then we they like, hold the, all these little chips along the way but we don't know what to do with it or right. how to let go of it Okay. And so one of those big things is about being self-aware of what's mine and what's not. Mm -hmm. And if it's your energy, I get to say, I'm going to give that right back. Right. Like, I can give you space and I can honor that space. I'm going to give that energy right back to you. Right. I'm not taking it. Exactly. I don't really want that. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, no. I think, I mean, I, I'm glad you touched on that because I think a 
big thing for me because like I'm really like empathetic. Yeah. So like I feel like as a teammate, like I really love to like understand what everybody everybody's perspective is. Yeah. But like I know it was like it was a time when I'm like, okay, nah, like this yeah. this is too much because like y'all got a lot going on. So like all my athletes out there, you know, just take time for yourself. Make sure that you really, you know, calm down. Right. Alone alone time and just really just filter out what, what you want to keep and what yeah. you don't want. And to them, I would also say, like, pay attention when you notice that when the team changes, when Mm -hmm. the dynamic, because sometimes it's like the third quarter, fourth quarter, and all of a sudden, like, everybody falls flat. You're like, what the hell happened to the team? Exactly. Like, we were just fine the first two quarters, and all of a sudden, like, no. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, but was it the leader? Was it the captain? Was it somebody else that just kept nagging that had, like, a bad start to the game already that just Mm -hmm. infiltrated everybody else? Or was it the coach? Right. I mean, we talk a lot about the athletes having impact, mm. but coaches, yeah. sometimes it's the parents. You're right. <laughs> They'd mean, be so negative in the stands. You'd be like, oh, we're, like, we're only down by like two. Like, relax. It's unreal. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm a mom myself, uh-huh. and I've been to some of these games. Yeah. Woo, yeah. It's brutal. I was I like, know. I might just need to sit here with a recorder. <laughs> and, like, if this needs to be its own little thing. What are you saying and why? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so being self aware of what your triggers are. And if you're taking on other people's, because I I have that same gift of empathy. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, fun fact, that gift that we have come to know Mm -hmm. is actually because we've been in more trauma-like states as a kid that has caused us to be more aware Mm -hmm. of our environments. But now the way that our culture has packaged it is like, oh, no, you just can read people. You're so good. Oh, she talking that talk. (laughs) Yeah. You know what? We're just going to, I think we're going to end on that. (laughs) Hey, this is 110% Athlete Where We Break Your Slump. Me and Dr. Jess, you know, we're always happy to bring you the tips, the tricks, the just the, the insight on the mind and how to be a better athlete. Um, once again, if you have any questions, if you have any feedback, anything, we don't care what it is, find us on Ibble yeah. at 110% Athlete Where You Break Your Slump. Again, don't forget that. We're <laughs> going to break your slump. We're going to... We're gonna have like right? Hall of Famers like oh, this, like this is me great, right? Like little yeah. kids, just like oh, I want to be the best, like right? Yes, it's but, all about being authentic in the sport. Oh, be genuine, yes. be yourself, have fun. Yes, yes. No judgment here. No, none. No <laughs> safe zone. Safe. <laughs> yes. But yeah, find us on Ibble. Um, can where 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 can they find you at? Um, so I you can find me at uh, altier.com, and that is the company that I work for currently. Can they, can they follow you on Instagram or anything? Oh, yeah. Or, oh, my gosh. Sorry, guys. Yeah. I was like, uh, just go to my website. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Jess Garza. And then my Instagram for Altier is at Altier Texas TX. Yep. And if you have any questions for me, you can find me on Instagram at underscore the Jordan Savage. Or find me on, on Ibble at Jordan Savage. We got we to gotta make you an Ibble, yeah, too. Do. Yeah, Um, But, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be here. We're going to be open. I'm excited. I am pumped. I mean, that was, that was, that was money. This is so good. Yeah, it was really good.